Hannibal, welcome to the podcast, and thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. Um, to start, I think it's helpful to have a better sense of what the Greenwood district was like before the massacre. Can you transport us to the neighborhood and to some of its most prominent figures just to lay that groundwork? The Greenwood district is the historic black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So it's part of the city of Tulsa. This was an era of Jim Crow segregation. So the black community sat just north of the Frisco tracks uh, in or near downtown Tulsa. It's roughly a 35 square block area historically. And it was a business district, as you noted, fondly dubbed ultimately Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street for me is a misnomer. Black Main Street would be a better label just because most of the businesses were small businesses, uh, mom and pop type operations, entrepreneurial concerns and professional service providers. So you would be in the Greenwood district, let's say 1920, 1921 early on, and you could find movie theaters and dance halls and pools, pool halls, barbershops, beauty salons, restaurants, grocery stores, haberdasheries, cleaners, confectionaries, hotels, rooming houses, jitney services, and on and on and on. You could also rely on the service of doctors and lawyers and accountants and dentists. So it was the, the kind of Main Street community that one might find anywhere in America, but uh, it's unique as was because this was an era of rigid segregation. So the fact that these black folks were all concentrated in this area, supporting one another, circulating and recirculating and recirculating dollars in this narrow geographic community uh, to undergird and support the financial fortunes of the community was truly remarkable. Uh, Tulsa, Greenwood, Black Wall Street was quite literally the talk of the nation. So it was an anomaly in many ways. This was not um, common in this period of America. Absolutely. So it was, for Black folks, an example. It was something aspirational. Booker T. Washington, you know, visited Tulsa, visited the all-black town of Bowley, visited Muskogee, which had a strong, Muskogee, Oklahoma, which had a strong uh, black business community as well. And Booker T. at the time was talking about this notion that if we as black folks could demonstrate our industriousness, our competence at business, our ability to self-govern, then racism might well abate and white people might well accept us as kind of co-equals. Now that seems rather fanciful looking back, but at the time you can understand how that might resonate with some people. You know, let, let's just show them that we can do this, that we got this, and then maybe we can all just get along. It didn't quite pan out that way. No, so what actually happened because in fact, it seems like the reverse happened, that white people in the community were actually jealous of this prosperity. So a number of things happened. So there's confluence of factors that led to the massacre in 1921. But I think the thing that you're pointing to is something that I would refer to with a psychological designation, cognitive dissonance. So if, if, you, if you realize that the ascendant racial philosophy of the day was white supremacy, that's without question. If you subscribe to a white supremacist mindset, and if you're living in Tulsa in 1921 on the south side of the Frisco tracks near downtown, and you're looking over to the north side of the Frisco tracks, and you're seeing these people who are inferior, subordinate to you in your mind, but they are living in homes that they own, they're driving cars, they're wearing nice clothes, they're going to restaurants in their own community, then something is amiss, askew, and awry. And so you need, as a white person who subscribes to white supremacy, you need to harmonize what you believe ought to be true and what you're actually observing on the ground. And one way you might do that is through violence. And there was a reason that 
people believed it ought to be that way. I mean, the the general environment across the country, you know, was one of a, a peak of racial violence with the lynchings, with segregationist black codes. Can you say more about the sort of larger environment that was influencing this microcosm? Historians and sociologists often use the phrase the nadir of race relations in America to describe the early part of the 20th century. That's a great phrase, I think. The low point of race relations in America, just for the reasons you, you cite. There are these events occurring all throughout the United States called race riots. They are largely assaults on black communities. In 1919, just two years prior to the Tulsa outbreak, there are more than two dozen so-called race riots. James Weldon Johnson, who was with the NAACP, used the metaphor red summer, red referring to blood flowing through the streets from these outbreaks in cities like New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore and Washington, D.C. and Chicago and Longview, Texas and Elaine, Arkansas. And I could go on and on and on. The other thing that's happened simultaneously is lynching. Lynching is simply a form of domestic terrorism. It's an implementation tool for white supremacy. The point of lynching has something but not everything to do with the victim. It has more to do with the group to which the, from which the victim is drawn and, and reinforcing in their minds um, that white is absolutely supreme and that you should have fear in your hearts and minds of the consequences of stepping outside your bounds. I also want to clarify, when you say race riots, I feel like sometimes that term is is not the best way to describe what was happening. Like if we're looking at the race riots, as they're called in Chicago in 1919, that was really an incident where, you know, a, a black boy was swimming on the quote unquote wrong side of Lake Michigan and was stoned to death by a white man. Um, and right. then the, the riots were really an invasion and and violence against the black community in Chicago. So can you clarify what race riots mean? Because I feel like it's a little, um, it's unclear. And to me, it's it's a continuation of um, the lynchings and the sort of terror that was pervasive. Race riot is a term of art that was used to describe interracial incidents back in the early 20th century. So what I encourage people to do is engage in critical thinking about nomenclature. So with respect to what happened in Tulsa then, I think there are five critical questions that need to be asked. Who named this event? Who was at the, who otherwise, in other words, who was at the table when the event was named? Who was missing from the table when the event was named? What is the significance of the name that was given? In Tulsa was race riot. Part of the significance was that insurance policies had force majeure clauses. And so in the, in the clause, if your damage was occasioned by riot or civil unrest, the insurance policy wouldn't pay off. So that it's really legally significant that it was called a race riot. Next, ask yourself, once you know the facts of the matter, what other terms, what alternatives might be used? And in Tulsa, I would posit that there are a number of things that we could call what happened. There are certainly elements of the word riot were involved. Um, the, the term that's in vogue right now is massacre because it focuses more on the, the perpetrators and the viciousness and the magnitude of the destruction. Another term we might consider is pogrom, which is more, uh, has a more European context to it, but it really means removing people forcibly from their environs, taking their, their property, taking their land. There's evidence that that was in the minds of some of the leaders in Tulsa, both before and after the massacre. So we could think about that term. Ethnic cleansing is another term that might apply. Genocide is another term that might apply. Holocaust is a term that might apply. Holocaust, really, the core of meaning of Holocaust has to do with destruction by fire, which is exactly what happened to the Greenwood community, it was burned to the ground. Some people have called it a white riot to say, yes, there were riotous conditions perpetrated by white people. Some people have called it an assault. Um, some of the survivors used the, the term that some a few people did use back in the, back in the day was a race war because it's the interracial conflict element of it. So all those things have application to what happened. So we, we need to understand that and understand that no term is perfect. Hmm. Even the term that, that has 
has currency right now, which is massacre. So people have, have remarked to me, and I, I, I certainly understand it. One of the limitations of massacre is that in the minds of many people, it is synonymous with slaughter, which suggests the taking of the lives willy nilly of people who are victims and wholly defenseless and helpless. Hmm. The problem with that is there were a number of black men in the Greenwood community who put up a robust, albeit short lived resistance to the invasion. And for some people, using the term massacre really marginalizes the efforts of these people who affirmatively defended the community. So every, any term we use has some sort of limitations or footnotes to it. But I think but, your point is that words are important here and words, critical words, thinking words around them is important. Hannibal, I'm wondering if I um, could back up a little bit and ask you, for those who don't know what the actual event was, what the inciting incident was that caused for now, I'll call it the massacre. Um, can you take us back to that day on May 31st, 1921 and tell us what the sort of, what lit the match on, on what I'm understanding is a tinderbox in Tulsa. Yeah, so Tulsa was a, was a tinderbox. And let me just tick off a, a few things that caused it to be a tinderbox. So, so the national context of, of race and racism, we talked about lynchings and so-called race riots was, that, that's a factor. Land lust, the fact that the Greenville community sat on land that was desired by railroads and other industrialists, that's a factor. Cognitive dissonance, we've talked about sort of garden variety jealousy, that's a factor in a white supremacist mindset. The KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, the iconic domestic terrorist organization had a huge presence in Tulsa and Oklahoma during the 1920s. That's a factor. And then finally, um, the media. It was a, a newspaper, it was a daily afternoon newspaper that published a series of incendiary inflammatory articles and editorials that really fomented hostility in sectors of the white community against the black community. So that's why Tulsa was a tinderbox or a powder keg in 1921. So we need a catalyst, we need an igniter, we need a match to throw on the smoldering embers. And that occurs on May 30th, 1921, which is Memorial Day. <clears throat> it involves two teenagers, Dick Rowland, 19 years old, black boy who shines shoes downtown for a living, Sarah Page, white girl, 17 years old, who runs an elevator manually in the Drexel building downtown. Dick Rowland, knowing that restrooms are largely unavailable to black folks downtown, he. He, he figures there's, there's a restroom in the Drexel building. I'll go over there. He goes to he goes to the Drexel building, boards the elevator. Something happened on the elevator. We don't know that may have caused it to jerk or to lurch. And Dick Rowland bumped into, stepped on the foot of, or brushed up against Sarah Page. In any event, she overreacted. She began screaming. The elevator landed back in the lobby. Dick Rowland, frightened, ran from the elevator. Sarah Page, distraught exited the elevator. She was comforted by a locally owned store clerk, um, a store clerk from a locally owned store is what I mean. And she told him her story of being assaulted on the elevator, which was really not true. And she would ultimately re recant the original story. Now he was concerned. You might be concerned, a young woman screaming in, in a public building, says she's been assaulted. He called the police. The police ultimately arrested the boy, Dick Rowland, put him in jail, jail set atop the courthouse. Meanwhile, that could have been the end of the story had it not been for the intervention of the Tulsa Tribune, which the next day, May 31st, 1921, published a story about it. The story was entitled, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator. So the caption of the story really telegraphs the content and the content is a false narrative of an attempted rape in broad daylight in a public building in downtown Tulsa. The story goes out of its way to make the girl Sarah Page look virtuous and as a corollary make the boy Dick Rowland look villainous. A white mob begins to gather on the lawn of the courthouse and there's lynch talk, talk of seizing the boy from the jail, taking him out to a public place and lynching him. Hannibal, can I just interrupt for one second and, and pause on the role of this Tulsa newspaper? Because not only did it make no attempt to capture the facts of the situation? It's a call to action. Um, this is clearly a paper that had an ulterior motive of inciting violence. And not only that, but the narrative that it is choosing to make headline news 
is a narrative that has a larger context, right? The um, this sort of notion of somebody, of a black man attacking a white woman. This was a narrative that I think, I imagine the authors of that headline would know would, would fulfill a sort of larger um, narrative that people had in their minds. Is that accurate? Sure, I mean, it's definitely a triggering narrative. I mean, the great taboo is, is the black male, white female. Um, and the, the white supremacist notion is that, you know, the, the ultimate aim of, of black males is to despoil white female innocence. I mean, that whole narrative is part of the white supremacist mantra. Right. And, and they knew that. They knew right. that at the time. Um, and so they, they knew that the, the article would have the effect it had, which was to rile up thousands of white men. Uh, black men get word of this. They, 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 they want to protect Dick Rowland from lynching because they know that lynching is certainly a possibility. Lynching is happening all over the country. There had been a public lynching of a white boy really just nine months earlier, a guy named Roy Belton, who had been accused of murdering a taxi cab driver. Um, he probably did do it, uh, but, but he didn't get his day in court. He was seized by a mob with complicity of law enforcement, taken out to a public space near Tulsa and hanged. Um, there were hundreds of people who witnessed the hanging, including law, law enforcement officers. And according to eyewitnesses, people fought over scraps of his clothing because they wanted souvenirs. That, that was not uncommon at the time either. Right, so you can so, understand why the black community would be really, really concerned for the safety of Dick Rowland. Right, so some of these men uh, were World War I veterans. World War I had just ended. They knew how to use weapons. Uh, so several dozen black men marched down to the courthouse to protect Dick Rowland. He was in jail on top of the courthouse. Um, conflict ensued. Words exchanged between the large white group, small black group. White man comes over, trying to, tries to take a gun from a black man. The gun discharges. And I'll use the words of a survivor who said, all hell broke loose after that. So the violence lasted roughly 16 hours, quelled by a unit of the National Guard that came in from Oklahoma City. Uh, black men, as I mentioned earlier, put up a vigorous, albeit short-lived, defense of the Greenwood community. They were overrun. They were outnumbered, outgunned. Uh, the large white mob spilled over the Frisco tracks into the Greenwood community, shooting and looting and burning, destroying everything in sight, murdering people. Many of the people in the mob, the white mob, were deputized by local law enforcement officers and members of the mob affirmatively prevented the Tulsa Fire Department from extinguishing the fires, which, which allowed things to burn out of control. Planes flew over the Greenwood community during the chaos. These were private planes. The official uh, rendition of facts suggests that the planes were reconnoitering. They were looking to see what was going on on the ground. Um, the, the evidence indicates that the planes were both strafing the community with bullets and dropping some sort of incendiary devices on the community. These might have been kerosene or turpentine um, balls. That, whatever they were, they caused the flames to uh, spread more rapidly and burn more brilliantly. The planes the were from of, the community or they were from outside coming in? They were privately owned planes is, all, is what we know. I don't, I don't think they've been specifically identified, but we had a commission formed in 1997, issued a report in 2001. One of the things they looked at was whether planes were used in this violence. And they concluded, because part of what people wanted to know is if the government was complicit. Yes, in, that's in what I was use curious of, about. Yeah, and the, the answer, their answer was no, that these are private planes. I don't remember exactly all the details, but 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 that's the key finding that they're Got private it. planes. Um, there are a number of credible eyewitnesses who talked about planes and talked about seeing the bombs being dropped. So that's almost certainly it's almost certainly true. When the dust settled, we know that. Um, probably a range of 100 to 300 people were killed, most of them black. Uh, not all of them, but most of them were black. We don't know the exact number, we'll never know because for a number of reasons. One is poor record keeping. The second is we know the number of people were gravely injured and left town and certainly died elsewhere. We know that some families summarily buried their friends and kin. And we know that their persistent uh, narratives, oral histories, and documents that suggest that there are mass graves still in existence. We're 
we're we're actually engaged in a mass graves investigation process right now. So those are some of the reasons we will never know the exact death count. Again, the range we believe is 100 to 300 people killed, hundreds of people, no, no doubt, injured. At least 1,250 homes in the Black community were destroyed, as were a number of commercial and business establishments. Some Black families were interned, very much like people of Japanese ancestry were interned during World War II. They were rounded up, taken to these internment centers, and typically had to get, have a green card countersigned by a white person who would agree to vouch for them to get them out of these detention or internment centers. And then we also know that the Red Cross provided um, really great relief in terms of um, in the immediate post-massacre period, um, healthcare, food, shelter, clothing, et cetera. Red Cross was called Angels of Mercy, both by people in the black community and people in the white community. And we know that a couple of downtown churches that still exist did a yeoman's job in, in providing post-massacre relief. First Presbyterian Church and Holy Family Cathedral. And one thing that I feel like when, when we're talking about this that, that can just feel hard to connect to is what it was actually like, the terror that one felt, what it was actually like to live through this. I, I actually was looking at um, some of the oral histories that were gathered about a decade ago. And I was wondering if I could um, play you back one of them um, one clip um, and just have you respond to it a little bit. Um, sure. it, is, it is a clip from George Monroe, um, who was five years old at the time. Um, and just for our I audience. Knew, and yeah. I knew him. I, oh. so he has a great story. Yes, he does. Oh, amazing. Um, the clip that I'm going to play um, has some clicking sounds for our audience. Um, that's because pictures were being taken at the same time that the recording was happening. My mother was with her family, four children, two boys, and two girls. All of us were in the house. When we saw coming up the walk in the front of the house off of Eastern Street, four men with torches in their hands. These torches were burning. When my mother saw them coming, she says, you get up under the bed, get up under the bed, get up under the bed. And all four of us got up under the bed. I was the last one, and my sister grabbed me and pulled me under there. And while I was under the bed, one of the guys coming past the bed stepped on my finger. And I was, as I was about to scream, my sister put her hand over my mouth so I couldn't be heard. Now, I remember that. Can you tell us what you hear in this account? And were there other accounts that have also stuck with you over the years? Yeah, that certainly is one of them. And I can tell you, um, I don't necessarily uh, usually recommend fiction, but, but the imagination of this event that was Watchmen. done by Watchmen, yeah. just the, that short three or four minute segment is spot on in my mind. It's exactly what I imagine the terror would have been like and what it must have felt like to be in the moment. I think that's just a superb, um, again, reimagining of, of that terror. And, it, and, and I think if George were here, George Monroe, he, he would agree with that. Um, I think that really captures what those folks must have felt like back in that in that period. In fact, it, it's so well done that I occasionally use that clip in some of my talks. Yeah, I mean, I think also just, you know, a lot of the oral histories seem to be from children or people who were children at the time because that's that's who was still alive. Right. Um, right. You know, and it strikes me that that is something you carry with you for the rest of your life, that those impressions go so deep. Um, so, you know, I'm, I wanna keep that in mind as we transition into what recovery looked like. Um, what, so May 30th, May 31st, you wake up burning. What happens next? Like, what does recovery look like? Does everybody flee? Do people stay? What does that look like? Yeah, you know, most people, most people stayed. Some people did, of course, leave, but most people stayed. And the leadership of the city made some promises that that were unkept. Um, the, the mayor, T.D. Evans, the the city commission, and the chamber 
they immediately began victim blaming. It's referred to in print as a Negro uprising. Forget about riot. Forget about massacre. It's a Negro uprising. Um, I mean, so, this is some of what we were talking about in in naming it a race riot. Right, right. And the and the Tulsa Tribune, the, the daily afternoon paper that I mentioned earlier, published an article on June 4th, which is three days after the end of the massacre. And it was entitled, It Must Not Be Again. And one would would think or one may think that the substance of the article is wow we had this incredible calamity in our community we can't ever let that happen again what are we what have we come to but that's not what the article was about it must not be again first sentence such a district as the old nigger town must never be allowed in tulsa again second sentence it was a cesspool of iniquity and corruption and it's a much longer editorial. So I share that with everybody. I don't sanitize it because it's vile and we need to know that. And it also is really a testament to what I think is most important, which is this is a story about the indomitable human spirit of these black people who created something remarkable, sustained it over time, rejuvenated it after its destruction, and it's still with us. So that indomitable human spirit is what's really important, the character of those people. In the face of open and obvious hostility, as illustrated in the Tulsa Tribune, in the promises made and promises broken, in the victim blaming and shaming. It's interesting. So the community comes, it comes back. Um, when I've heard you talk about uh, the recovery um, and, and the, the massacre as a whole, um, I hear you often make uh, a very strong point about this, the indomitable spirit over a sort of victim narrative. I'm curious um, if that was a very intentional um, decision that you were always going to make sure that whenever you talk about this, that you raise up the spirit. Um, how did you come to sort of making sure that that was always a part of how you talk about this event. That's what's most important to me. And that's what stands out to me. I'm, I'm, I would probably be characterized as an optimist generally, but I'm also a realist. So I don't like to sugarcoat stuff. So you notice when I'm talking about the Tulsa Tribune article, I'm not gonna say such a district as the old in town must never be lit. No, that's not what they said. I wanna say what they said. Um, but I also want to elevate the positive elements of this story, which I think are the most important elements of the story, and emphasize that part of the story is universal. And that is what's most important about this whole story is the same thing that's what's most important about the Holocaust. And it, it's the imperative that we embrace our shared humanity, because if we, if we all do that, then these things don't happen. We don't have a 1921 Tulsa race massacre. We don't have a Holocaust. We don't have an insurrection on January 6th, by the way. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm also, I, I'm sort of curious. I, I don't even know if there's a way to answer this question, but I'm imagining, you know, the spirit and the decision people who stayed made to rebuild immediately um, in and, and stay among the people who looted their property, burned their property. How do you make sense of um, what it was like to stay and face up um, and, and stay and, and have these neighbors and, and face this, what feels like violent, wretched violence that, that was just visited upon your town? So when you frame it like that, my, my initial or intuitive response is, what is the choice? Hmm. What, what's happening in Tulsa is emblematic of what's happening in America. So there's a, I think of the Martha Reeves and the Vandellas song from the 60s, Nowhere to Run. Where is it that you're going to go that you're going to be safe and free from this kind of hostility? I don't know. I, mean, I, I, just, I, just, I understand the urge to, to go to a different place and to a better place. What I'm suggesting is what places are substantially better 
and, and, and in what place might you be guaranteed safety if you're a black person in 1921 in the United States? Mm. Yeah, yeah, um, that is completely true. I'm also curious as a historian, you know, you, you and others are calling attention to a, a very real violent chapter in our history, um, but you're, you've also called attention to the violence of forgetting. Um, you know, the fact that for a long time, we didn't talk about this event. Do you have a sense of how this forgetting happened, both on in the white community and in the black community? And also what its effect was? Yes, I think it's, its effect is the state of race relations that we find ourselves in right now. <laughs> you know, part, part, of, part, of the, part of what happens when you don't address your wound is it festers. And so the, the problem is exacerbated by your failure, your failure to tend to it. So at the time of the massacre, there were, I think, a complex web of psychological dynamics that were going on. Tulsa was on an upward tra trajectory becoming the oil capital of the world. The city fathers, and I use, were, I use the phrase city fathers intentionally because that, that's what, it, these were men, these were white men who were the leaders of the, of the community. Um, they wanted Tulsa to be perceived as a cosmopolitan city. It was on an upward trajectory, attracting uh, the rich and famous, and they wanted that to continue. So they felt, you know, this, this unfortunate incident in 1921 is just like, it's not really helpful to promoting and boosting our city. So let's just kind of sweep that under the rug and, and move forward. That's in the white community. In some sectors of the white community, and you can see it in newspaper articles and so forth, there was some shame. White people who felt, you know, how could we have let this happen in our community? It's, it's, it's horrific, it's terrible, it's awful. And for that reason, they didn't want to talk about it either. They wanted to forget about it. In the black community, there was arguably what I would call post-traumatic stress disorder, even though the term, I'm not sure the term was coined then, but, but, it, but it describes what was going on. Anxiety and fear, fear that this happened once, it could happen again. This kind of violence did happen again later on in, in so-called race riots like Rosewood, Florida in 1923. So it could happen again. Um, some of the survivors talked about not wanting to burden their children with this uh, historical horror because they felt it might have a, a stunting or a stultifying impact on their ability to grow and become successful. So they didn't, they didn't, wanna, they didn't wanna bring it up to their kids. That's really interesting. So sort of the idea of what well, you were talking earlier around lynchings, that part of the reason to do this is to cause terror. So was the thought like, we are not going to continue that goal, we are going to stop it here. Um, that somehow the, the story of what happened would almost complete the, the mission of what people had in mind, which was to cause a terror that would last beyond the actual event. Yeah, but, but more directly that, that, that sharing the story would be, have some sort of debilitating effect on kids. Traumatic. And, and, and that they would think less of themselves going forward and, and be able to achieve less. And so let's just not share that. Let's, we, well, let's focus on the positive stuff. This is a negative experience that, that, I, that I've had. I'm going to keep that self-contained and they don't have to know about that. Another interesting piece that really struck me as I was reading about um, the Tulsa race massacre, um, you know, as we're talking about uh, a sort of national forgetting was just how many elements are still active today that happened back then and the effect of not having had a more complete reckoning off with this and with so many events. But, you know, just thinking through some of the list, like the role of the media, the role that the media played in this, in this massacre, the role of law enforcement and how law enforcement deputized people in the white mob. You know, racism in law enforcement is definitely something that we are still tackling today. And then, you know, even the idea you had mentioned the internment of, of the black of people in the black community, you know, detention without due process is definitely something that we are still facing today. And, and it really struck me that this one event has so many pieces that are absolutely still playing out right now. Um, and, and sort of uniquely in that way. So um, 
you know, it, as we shift into understanding how not to keep repeating um, events like this in, in all their various elements, um, can you talk about um, what the process of recovery and reconciliation looks like? You, you sort of mapped it out in a, in a really interesting way. Can you talk about those steps? Yeah, for, for me, the process involves an alliterative formulation of acknowledgement, apology, and atonement. So acknowledgement has to do with many things that we're doing right now, which is working on curriculum. Uh, we created about three years ago a teacher's institute so teachers can come together, be immersed in the history, become comfortable and competent in the history, uh, discuss uh, pedagogy, how to teach it at age appropriate levels, all that. Give them the tools they need to be able to be able to teach it and be excited about teaching it. We're building right now Greenwood Rising, which is a world-class history center um, on Greenwood and, and, and Archer. And the idea is that it's a place where people can come and learn the history in an experiential, immersive way with the goal of leveraging the history from Tulsa and taking or gleaning its lessons such that we can confront the challenges that are present today. So in our final gallery in Greenwood Rising, we are gonna challenge patrons to think about Black Lives Matter, mass incarceration, Black community police relations, educational deficits, healthcare disparities, and all those other things that we know are race-based that are challenges that we face. So really the upshot is we wanna make sure that people understand there's a through line from the past and our history to the present and where we are today. And there are things that we can glean from the past that should inform us in the present and, and for the future. So that, that's kind of part of the acknowledgement piece. Apology has to do with both literal apologies and creating ways for people to enhance compassion and empathy. So in terms of literal apologies, we've, we've talked about the fact that law enforcement officers deputize people in the white mob that destroyed the Greenwood community. Our former police chief, Chuck Jordan, in 2012, I believe it was, issued a public apology at John Hope Franklin Reconciliation Park for the dereliction of duty on behalf of the Tulsa Police Department back in 1921. That's significant. I mean, that makes a difference. How was that received? Well, <laughs> that, that, that's an acknowledgement, acknowledgement of what happened and an apology from the person who now leads that organization. And part of what he said was, this is definitely not who we are now, but, but we did this back in 1921 and it was wrong. That's important. If you're talking about building bonds of trust, um, that goes a long way. You gotta, so, you gotta show something in the, in, the, in the present, something affirmative, but that ownership and apology makes a big difference. Can apology also look like reparations to those who are survivors in whose families were affected? Yes. Yeah, so when I when I talk about reparations, I'm talking about it in the broad sense. So I'm talking about making amends, repairing damage, and there are many many ways that one might do that. So in the term in terms of the massacre here in 1921, there's a lawsuit pending. There was a lawsuit that failed back in 2003, a federal lawsuit. But there's another lawsuit pending in state court now seeking reparations for uh, ident certain identified survivors and descendants, monetary reparations for, for individuals. Um, that, that's one way to look at reparations, but think of reparations as, uh, let's say, arrows in a quiver. That's one arrow. There are many other arrows, which include investments of various types in targeted communities. Here in Tulsa, it might be investments in uh, mentorship programs, particularly for black youth, or investments in opportunities for black entrepreneurs to grow and expand. That might be a form of, of reparations. It might be investments in facilities like I've just described, Greenwood Rising, this history center, because that helps the whole community understand its history and the legacy of that history, 
which is foundational if we're ever going to, in a serious way, discuss and dialogue around how we move forward together. So reparations to me is a, is a mix of things not all of which involve direct monetary outlays to a particularly identified people. I'm not opposed to that. I think it, it's certainly morally justified. Do I think the court system is likely to provide the relief sought? I don't think that relief is gonna be forthcoming in the court system, it, which is not to say, I don't think, fine, you can pursue it. I don't think it's gonna be successful because you're basically asking uh, one, one of the systems and institutions that has been problematic historically uh, to, to sort of right itself. And you're also asking the system to open a Pandora's box of grievances over decades and centuries um, that would create litigation from now for the foreseeable future in communities all across the land. I just don't think you're a lawyer as well, so you know. Yeah, I, I just don't think any, I don't think any judge or court is going to do that. I just don't think so. That's part of the reason that this sort of non-racialized barrier was interposed in the federal lawsuit. The federal lawsuit was filed, and the and and the, and the court said, "Well, you know, we have this thing called the statute of limitations." Right. And they didn't they didn't say this, but but the subtext is. The statute of limitations has nothing to do with race. It's a precept in law. So you're barred by this. And the plaintiffs rightly said at that point, well, you know, there, there may have not have been any intention to interpose this as a racial matter, but the reality was, if we had filed this lawsuit back in 1921, we would have been laughed out of court. I mean, we had no chance of success on the merits, no matter what those merits are back in 1921. Right, so the statute of limitations isn't really a thing because it, it wouldn't have been heard back right. then anyway. So it's sort right. of a ridiculous argument. Yeah, um, and, and know, I think that's, a, that's it, I absolutely agree with that. I think it's the way that they, they framed that their rebuttal was, was brilliant. Yeah, and one thing that really strikes me about some of the um, ways of, of reconciling that you've laid out um, you know, teaching teachers how to teach this, um, the historical center is that um, it really puts um, emphasis on the fact that this is a process, that reconciliation doesn't happen and that it's over. It has to happen over time. And I think it feels like that's really important to mention on the eve of the centennial, because I sometimes feel like, like we are right now, everybody will talk about, or a lot of places will do something to honor the 100 years since the Tulsa race massacre. But then the day after the centennial, it's sort of like everyone goes back to their regular scheduled programming. And I think what the programs you, you set out, it seemed to make a point that there is a life to this reconciliation process after May 31st. Is that yeah. your intention? Yeah, so I, I think what you said is absolutely true, but, but I, I would say this to that, and that is, and I, I don't mean to be personal, I'm going to use the term. Oh, you. no, please. You meaning media. Yes. So, <laughs> so what you do after the centennial doesn't really matter to me. What matters is what the people in this community do. So when we, when we created the 1921 Tulsa Rights Massacre Centennial Commission back in 2015, it was never the intention that we are working toward um, doing some events for a particular day. We're doing some projects for the long haul. It just so happens that it's convenient to attract people like you to have this moment, this particular moment in time. And hopefully people like you will come to the community and highlight the long-term projects like Greenwood Rising, curriculum reform, and other things that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think also, you know, it high, moments like these are an opportunity to make sure that the nation is remembering that this has pulled today, that there are reverberations today. Um, but yes, absolutely. Supporting the local community, healing the local community is a, a huge piece of this. Um, well, Hannibal, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was really meaningful. You are such an expert in the field um, and it is, is an honor to get to talk to you.
Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell or subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We so appreciate the feedback. Until next time, stay strong.